Alfredo Diano from uh, Carlos Tercera University from Madrid. Please. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for, uh, uh, thank you first to the organizers for um, organizing the, the workshop and keeping it alive, even with the pandemic. And uh, I wish we could all be there, uh, hopefully in the future. And thank you all for uh, staying there, wherever you are. Um, so um, let me see. Okay, yeah. So um, this talk is uh, again on, well, and on a topic related to orthogonal polynomials, although not, not only. It's based on um, in a recent paper. Maybe we can do this. Wait, if I can put this so that it doesn't slip. Okay, maybe like this. Um, so this talk is based on this uh, first paper that I have put here. This is a recent uh, collaboration with Ahmad Barumi from the University of Michigan and Andrew Celsus, who finished his PhD in Cambridge uh, not, not long ago. Um, and this paper in, it kind of completes the, the, the analysis that we did in the, well, not only us, but um, at, uh, this, these are our references. The, the, the other three are kind of special cases, uh, particular cases that um, that we had um, and we wanted to, to complete. So the last two papers have to do with orthogonal polynomials and, and large degree asymptotics in a, in a case of complex orthogonal polynomials that originally was motivated by numerical analysis. Um, and the second one is, uh, well, is, uh, well, it was in the archive, it's been on the archive for six years now, so it had kind of a complicated story. Um, but it's, uh, it's also based on orthogonal polynomials, but with a slightly different point of view. So we, we concentrate on uh, Hankel determinants and we look at asymptotic limits in a different regime. So um, I think it's interesting also if you don't like Riemann Hilbert, this is Riemann Hilbert free because we use completely different techniques based on standard um, methods of asymptotic analysis. So um, I think it's, it's, a, it's a good complement of, um, of, of the other two. Uh, okay, let me see if I, yeah. So, so this is the, the general setting um, from the point of view of orthogonal polynomials, although at the end I would like to give uh, an alternative or complementary point of view if you want. Um, so we are considering a family of orthogonal polynomials that we call Pn. Um, so we take the orthogonality on the interval minus one, one. Um, with respect, this is standard orthogonality, scalar orthogonality, with respect to a weight function that, um, that is uh, an exponential. Here you have exponential of minus a linear function, uh, S times Z, and S is an arbitrary complex parameter. So I put the orthogonality of minus one, one, but uh, we can use, well, if the weight function is complex, we are going to use the flexibility of uh, moving this to the complex plane using non-Hermitian orth uh, orthogonality, very much like Arno just presented before. Um, and we take this, this parameter S as, as arbitrary complex uh, number. So it's not a, it's a very non-standard weight. So what we like to study is, okay, standard things in orthogonal polynomials, but, well, starting with the limit zero distribution, the moment you have a, non a weight function that is not um, positive, not even real value. Um, then, well, the question of what is the limit distribution of the zeros is, is interesting, and it all, it uses all these uh, all the connections with potential theory and um, and so on. And basically, it's just what Arno described. I just put a, a normalized zero counting measure. I put a, a delta at each of the zeros of, of p n divided by n, and then I, I ask if if this discrete measure has some kind of limit in some sense and Okay, if it, what, is, what is the limit measure and where, where it's supported and so on. Um, and then related to that, you can do asymptotic behavior of whatever you prefer, the orthogonal polynomials. We concentrated on the coefficients of the recurrence relation, um, but you can study uh, other objects with the, with the same techniques. And you, you do have a recurrence relation if it, even if the weight function is not, is not a standard. Here you uh, didn't put, you, you assume that uh, Pn, Pn plus one, Pn minus one, exist, which is not guaranteed because your weight function is not, is not positive. But if they, they exist and they, they, they have the right degrees, then there is a, 
recurrence relation that join, that relates them. Um, a very classical example, of course, in this weight function, you put s equals to zero, then you have Legendre. Okay, so nothing nothing new there. Um, if you put a real parameter here, um, then you don't have a classical family anymore. Um, you have some exponential deformation of Legendre polynomials. Um, so this deformation from the point of view of orthogonal polynomials is, is, is a bit arbitrary. I mean, it is an exponential is a nice function, but um, so why would you consider it such an exponential? Uh, there's a point of view of integrable systems where, and it's, it's very well known, if you have certain kind of deformations with, for example, with exponential factors, uh, then you study the formation of, of quantities related to orthogonal polynomials with respect to this parameter S, and then you find uh, interesting or well-known identities. In this case, for example, this recurrence coefficient satisfies satisfy the total lattice equation when you consider differentiation with respect to S. And you can study other uh, other quantities uh, and the formation with respect to S. So in, in that sense, it is a kind of a natural um, example to work with. And it's simple enough so you can say many, many things explicitly. Um, so the problem that you have now, of course, is this, uh, what I mentioned before is that you you have a complex parameter, then your function, your weight function is not real valued. So forget about positive. Um, and then this bilinear form that you would use to, to define, to construct your orthogonal polynomials is not a scalar product anymore. So, well, in principle, anything can happen when you try to orthogonalize and construct your family of, of polynomials. And you may run into this kind of problem that this PN, PN is equal to zero for some N and S. Um, Okay, nevertheless, he has some questions. Does this actually happen? So that we, we started doing experiments with this with this kind of, of weight function and, and you find, okay, yeah, things can break down, but but not always. And uh, a second question, which I think it's, it's interesting as well, if things break down, then can you say something about the values of N and S where, uh, where the construction breaks down? And I'll come back to that in the, uh, near the end. Um, so apart from the real case where you have kind of the standard theory, even okay, Legendre or the formation of Legendre, there is this other case, which is called kissing polynomials, um, where the parameter is purely imaginary. So S is minus I omega. This is the notation that we used. So here you have your family of polynomials, orthogonal, hopefully, in this sense. Uh, so you want a PN multiply non-Hermitian uh, orthogonality um, with respect to uh, polynomials of lower degree and some constant different from zero, when k is equal to n. So there's no guarantee that this is going to this is going to happen. Um, in this paper that it was uh, with Andrew Celsus and Dan Herbrex and Ari Isoles, uh, that's the one that stayed in archive for a long time. Uh, there's, we study the well, we analyze the existence of the family of orthogonal polynomials. Um, so this was missing in the original the original version of the paper. And we found that there's an interesting difference between even and odd degrees of the polynomial. So the polynomials of even degree always exist. There is no problem with them, although they could break down, but it doesn't. And um, the polynomials of odd degree, they have uh, problems at a certain sequence of values of omega, which we call kissing points for, for a reason that I'll show you a picture in a moment. But we also have a look at differential and difference equations that you can get for these orthogonal polynomials and for the Hankel determinants and for the recurrence coefficients. And we look at asymptotics in this regime, omega tending to infinity, which is not the standard one in orthogonal polynomials. Um, so uh, this is, uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's uh, interesting too, and it uses completely different techniques. So there's no Riemann Hilbert to just use the use highness formula for the or the orthogonal polynomial, um, and then you have a multiple integral, and when omega is large, then you can use stationary phase or steep descent, the classical methods. And well, it's uh, you you get you get interesting combinatorics because you have to take into account the contributions from both endpoints plus one and minus one and all the combinations. Um, so the reason for this for this uh, funny name is that um, when when the, when you study the polynomials, then you have a, a degeneracy of, of the polynomials of odd degree. So if you look at the zeros as functions of omega, so when omega is equal to zero, these are the zeros of the polynomials. So, okay, that's fine. And then you start moving omega and then these zeros move into the complex plane. 
following some trajectories, and then at some values of this parameter omega and some sequence of discrete sequence of, of values of omega, um, the polynomials of consecutive degrees, here's P2 and P3 and P4 and P5 uh, below, they coincide because the well, the, the scalar, the, the norm, which is not a norm of P2 or P4 becomes zero. And then when I try to define P3 or P5, then I run into trouble. And then, well, you can normalize things in a different way and they become essentially multiple. So the P3 is a multiple of P2 and then they share the zeros. And this is this touching or kissing or whatever name you want to give it. Um, and then you have a whole sequence of values where this happens. So these sequences are not easy to, I mean, they're not very explicit, but you can see that there's a whole sequence where, where this happens and, and that sequence tends to, the zeros tend to, to plus one or minus one when omega tends to, tend to infinity. Um, so in this case of um, purely imaginary parameter, we had this information for finite n and we also had asymptotics, which is much more standard um, technique. I mean, uh, construction uh, in orthogonal polynomials. So you have to scale this parameter. Uh, so you put, well, not really scaling, like in the, if you have orthogonality in the, real, the whole real line, but you just relabeled your, your parameter and you put the n here and you have an n-dependent orthogonality. And then you look at things in, in, this, in this new parameter t. Um, and then in terms of this parameter t, this was in the paper in 2014, then you can find a critical value some value TC, um, which is the unique yeah, positive solution of this equation. Okay, you solve this numerically. There is there is only one positive solution that is 1.32 something, this t, t critical. And if you are below this value, then well, essentially what is happening is that you have a, a one cut case at the formation of the standard orthogonality of minus one one. So you get existence of the orthogonal polynomials for large enough n, meaning that Pn exists for n large enough and is a polynomial of degree exactly equal to n. Um, and the limit zero distribution, uh, well, is a measure, is an absolutely continuous measure, quite explicit, that um, lives on, a, on an analytic arc gamma zero that joins minus one and one. So this is a standard one cut case, which is the formation of, well, if the parameter is not, is not too large, then you are not going too far away from, from what you have when, when t is when t is zero. Okay, so this one cut case is terminology, you know, probably not only from orthogonal polynomials, but also from random matrix theory, for example. And if you go be, uh, beyond that um, critical case, this is the work of Andrew Celsus and Guillermo Silva last year. And then you have something similar, but you have a two cut case. If you know what, what that means, then um, you have existence of the orthogonal polynomials, although you have to be a bit careful with uh, the way you, you, you let n go to infinity. And then the limit, the, the limit zero distribution is not on one arc, but in two arcs symmetric with respect to the imaginary axis because of the property of the weight. And then this is a two cut case that you can compute the limit density of zeros, but you, as you probably know, if you've seen examples of this, then the, this two cut case is, is quite more complicated in terms of calculation of the of everything basically. Um, so we had this information on the on the imaginary axis in the in the in the, in the uh, t plane. So this is a kind of experiment of what happens um, if you take polynomial of degree fifty. You compute nothing. I mean nothing. Nothing uh, breaks down. You compute polynomial of degree fifty, and then you start moving this parameter t. And then here you are in the one cut case. So below the critical value, which was this 132 something. And then when you, once you go past this, this value, you can see in the lower part, then um, the support uh, breaks into, into, two, into two curves. Okay, so this is a transition from one cut uh, to two cut. Okay, so this is more or less information that we had. Um, and then the purpose of, of, of this last paper was to kind of uh, get the, the full picture with a complex parameter here. Um, so you have the information on the real line and on the imaginary axis in this S plane, and then you would like to uh, complete the, the, the picture. So you take this, this weight, you are scaling the, the parameter again. So E to the minus NSZ is your, is your weight. And then you would like to um, determine the values of S for which you have one cut or two cut. Uh, turns out that there are no more cases. There could be, but 
um, there's only these, these two possibilities. So these two cases are separated by, by what is called breaking curves in the in the S plane. So these breaking curves, well, the curves form of, of points which are called regular breaking points. And the idea is that if you go, if you cross that, if you move S uh, across one of these curves, then the topology of this limit curve or the zeros of the orthogonal polynomial is going to change in some way. So there could be some splitting, like the example I showed before, or it could be the birth of a new cut from one cut to two cut in a different way or something like that. Uh, you also have some breaking points which are called critical breaking points. Uh, these are essentially different. I'll, I'll, I'll go back to that in, in, a, in a moment. So this, the, the first part of the, of the problem was this geometric construction of what happens in the S, in the S plane, where are the breaking curves and, and what kind of regions do they, they define. We call this set of breaking curves B, math frac B. And then the first result is, the, is this structure. Um, so you have two critical breaking points. We'll see what that means later, which is S equals plus minus two. And then you have several breaking curves. Uh, so you have the real axis from minus infinity to minus two and from two to plus infinity. And you have these two curves, B plus, B minus. Um, these are level curves of, a, of a elementary functions. So this is, this is, this is, these are quite explicit. Um, and these curves separate, well, they define the, the separate three regions we call G0, G1 plus, G1 minus. Okay, so um, what you would expect, and this is what we prove later on, is that inside this lens, G0, you would have a one-cut case because of what you know from real case and from the pre-critical case on the imaginary axis, and then this G1 plus and G1 minus it is the two cut region. Okay, so this is, you complete the picture like that consistently with what you had before. Um, and then once you have this, this geometric construction, um, then, we, then we look at asymptotic behavior, in this case of the recurrence coefficients, just because of the connection with the total lattice equation and so on, but but you could, once you have the whole uh, asymptotic uh, analysis running, then, then you can look at, at other quantities if you want um, in, different, in the different regions given before. So the results that we get are basically four kind of asymptotics depending where you are. So the simplest one is um, the one cut region. So this inside this lens we call G0, uh, then you have a uh, very standard asymptotic expansion for the recurrence coefficient, just in inverse powers of n or uh, n square, depending on which one of the coefficients. And the coefficients will depend on s, so they well, they change. Uh, but but this uh, this kind of asymptotics is valid anywhere inside this this open region. Okay. So it's a one cut case. It's the simplest one. If you go outside, so g1 plus and g1 minus, then you have a two cut. Okay, so as you probably know, things are a bit more complicated. You have to be careful with the sequence with the with the n tending to infinity. It, it should be taking along some subsequences. And you also have a bit more complicated asymptotic expansion because you have this lambda zero, lambda one, which are the endpoints of the support of the limit measure. And these are sort of explicit. And you also have this m1n, m2n functions, which are uh, uh, complicated. Well, relatively complicated functions built with theta functions on a genus one Riemann surface. If you know how this works, then this is kind of standard two cut situation, but the calculations are, are, um, are, are more complicated, okay? So you have the one cut uh, case and the two cut, and then in between what you have is, okay, you can study first the regular breaking point. So this is along these blue curves, this B, B plus and B minus, and here um, you can study what happens as you let S tend to S star, S star is a point on, on, the, on one of these breaking curves. And you have to do what, um, uh, what is called a double scaling limit because you let N tend to infinity and you let S tend to S star in a coupled way. And this speed one over N is, is, is the critical one. So it's the one where you, where you see a non-trivial asymptotics. Then recurrence coefficients exist for large enough n, and then they well they satisfy this this they have this kind of expansion. It's a bit uglier than before, and you have fractional powers of n, and you have this s star and other parameters floating around. But but everything is is everything is explicit, and you can compute more terms if you want. 
So this is the limit, I should point out, this is the limit from inside. So S tending to a star from the one cut region. If you want to go from the two cut region, um, well, we didn't look at that, but it's, it's considerably more complicated in, in, in other examples, so probably here too. Um, and the last case is the, the critical breaking point, so plus two and minus two. Uh, and then here you have another double scaling limit. And now the speed, the critical speed is not one over n, but one over n to two thirds. So this is a, a different, different case. And what you need to describe the asymptotics of the recurrence coefficient is this function q, well, q square and q prime. And q is, um, is a certain solution, is a, called the generalized hastings macleod solution to Pan-Levé 2. So we saw in the talk of Galina yesterday, there was a list of six Pan-Levé equations, these nonlinear special functions. Um, so this differential equation here is Pan-Levé 2 with a, a specific value of this parameter is minus one half is a specific value of a parameter. And then you need one specific solution of this, of this equation with certain properties. Um, in particular, that this Q square minus plus Q prime is, is pole free for X, for, for, real, for real variable. Because if you, well, if you, if you think for, for a moment, this L2 uh, is the new variable. So if L2 is real, then S is real. And you know that if, if S is real, then um, there shouldn't be any problem with the construction of the orthogonal polynomial. So definitely you don't want any poles of these terms if the parameter is real. So you have to show, and this is indeed the case, that, that this, this solution is very particular in that sense. And this, this function, this uh, solution, hastings macleod has appeared in many different contexts. For example, in a paper of Arno and Alexander Itz and Jorgen Ostenson on a critical case in random matrix theory. And they, they, and they have to use this. Well, they, they, they include this solution as, as, a, as, a, as a particular case. Um, so this is, this, this is the asymptotic behavior. The methodology, I'm not going to go into too, too many details, but it's a standard uh, Riemann-Hilbert uh, and steep descent analysis. So uh, the, the Riemann-Hilbert problem is very standard for orthogonal polynomials. The only thing is that you have this, this freedom where you lose analyticity is not necessarily minus one one, so you make use no Hermitian orthogonality, and this this jump, uh, the jump of the matrix Y, it takes place on some curve sigma that joins uh, minus one one, minus one and one. But then the other conditions are very standard, so the jump is just with the weight function, and then you have normalization at infinity, as usual, and normalization when Z tends to plus minus one. Um, and the solution is the standard one with the orthogonal polynomials on the first, the first column and then the Cauchy transforms. Um, the only thing is that, okay, you have to assume that Pn exists and Pn is of degree n and then run the steeper descent method and, and show that that, it is, that is the case at least for, for n large enough. But, but otherwise the riemann hiller problem is, is quite standard. Um, the thing is that when you do this, the steep descent analysis, I'm not going to explain all the details because I, well, I don't have time, but there are two steps where um, you have to, as you know, if you have worked with, with similar examples, or you have seen some similar examples, you have to be careful with the, well, the two things, the asymptotics and the geometric construction in the S plane, first type of result, it get, gets combined because the first two steps in this steep descent analysis, the normalization at infinity and the opening of lenses, uh, they use a G function, or what we call it an H function, but it's, it's essentially the same thing. Uh, and this is related to the, to the limit zero distribution, which is also what you want to find. So at some point you have to make a guess, clever guess of what the limit distribution of zero is going to be, if it's one cut or two cut or some or whatever. And then run the, and then propose a G function or an H function and show that it works and that everything uh, goes fine in this steep descent analysis. So this H function um, is well, or G function, if you want. The only, the only difference is that I'm, uh, in, we added in this H function we added the, the the potential. That's basically the only difference, and the constant, the constant L. Um, so this H function satisfies an additive riemann hiller problem with constant jumps um, on a certain set of contours omega. You have a prescribed behavior at infinity, 
and you also need to control the real part of this function around that set of contours. So this is because so that the lensing, when you open lens, um, then the, the, the jumps become exponentially close to identity instead of blowing up. Um, so if all these conditions are, are met, so you have a value of S and then you propose some function H with an associated set of contours. Of course, this is coming from the theory of uh, Concha Rahman of Stahl on the asymptotics of orthogonal polynomials. If all the conditions are met and you can go through the method of a steep descent, um, everything works. And then you say that this point is a regular point. So, okay, in that, in that case, you know, you know what's going on. Um, so normally what you do in this, in this kind of analysis, you start with some cases where you know what's happening. That's why I pointed out the real case and the purely imaginary before, because we know what's going on. So for example, in the imaginary axis, you have this H function, as is the H function that corresponds to the one cut case. Um, and then you, you analyze to, to understand how the zeros of the orthogonal polynomials behave. In this case, you analyze an aquadotic differential, which in, the, in this case is very simple. It has just one double zero at one over s, sorry, two over s, and two poles at plus minus one. Uh, if you have a two cut case, it's very similar, but you have instead of you have a, another polynomial of degree two in the numerator with two different zeros, which are lambda zero, lambda one. Okay. Um, so you have this quadratic differential and you know from the theory of Gonchar Rahman of Stahl that, well, the, the zeros of Pn will be attracted to some trajectory of this quadratic differential. Um, okay, so then what you do is, well, okay, now you, you try to find the breaking points. So the H function is, is going to work in, in that case. So suppose that you propose a one-cut case and then you start moving the parameter S and that the whole construct, the whole construction with the orthogonal polynomials will move and you will change and you want to, 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 to say if it stays one cut, one cut or there's some kind of transition. And that transitions happen, those transitions happen at breaking points. So the breaking points can be characterized in terms of this function H is, is because there's a saddle point, Z naught that appears where the derivative is zero and the real part uh, of H is zero. Um, so basically what is happening is that you have an extra point that, for example, if, if you have one cut situation, then this, this extra point uh, coincides with the, with the trajectory with this, with this curve, and then it splits it into that would be kind of a transition. Um, if this, um, sorry, this should be Z naught. Z naught is a critical breaking point if, if Z naught coincides with a branch point, or there's a subtle point of order bigger than one that doesn't happen in this situation. Otherwise, it's a Z naught, sorry, as Oh, sorry, no, that was correct. SB is a critical breaking point if the saddle point has this property and otherwise it's a regular breaking point. So um, it, what happens in the one cut case, you start with the one cut case, which is the simplest, then the derivative of H is very simple. And then you, on, you can only have one saddle point, which is two over S. So you move S and then the saddle point is going to move and the trajectories of the quadratic differential are going to move and you have to see what's going on. So the critical breaking points are easy because it, they happen when this saddle point coincides with one of the endpoints, plus minus one. So you have S equals plus minus two. So that's, that's very simple. That's where they are coming. And otherwise it is a regular breaking point. And then you have to do a geometric analysis of this, of these breaking curves. You have to prove several things that um, the structure of these breaking curves. So there are smooth curves that consist on regular breaking points. Okay. If you think of one of these curves, B plus or, or B minus, well, what is happening? You have to prove it, but what is happening is that um, there's a splitting of the of the of this one cut into two cut. It's symmetric if you go along the imaginary axis. If you go along, if you go across the the, the curve of breaking points in a different in a, in a different place, then you will have an asymmetric splitting. Uh, and this uh, this curves of breaking points um, they cannot intersect except maybe at the uh, the critical breaking points and at infinity. And that's how you you work out the, the, this structure with the lens uh, shape and the, and, the two, and the two half lines. And then once you have this, the structure of the, of the breaking curves, then you go to each of the regions and then you use a principle that is typically called continuation in parameter space. So basically you, you show that if you're in one of these regions and you start moving the parameter S, um, then the topology 
is not going to change unless you hit a breaking point. And you know where the breaking points are because you know where the breaking curves are. So that's how you complete the, the proof that, that each of these regions inside and outside correspond, the whole region corresponds to one cut or two cut. Okay, so that's uh, more or less the, 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 asymptotic, the asymptotic analysis. Uh, there are quite a few details there, but, um, but I'd like to, to um, discuss just briefly um, the problem that I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, so can we say something about the values of S where P and where the construction of the orthogonal polynomials uh, break, uh, uh, breaks down? And, um, and this, is, this is well known, and this is the, the integrable systems, if you want perspective on, on this problem. So you, you can use the, the classical formula for the orthogonal polynomials that you never use for anything, but it's... it's uh, it's actually useful in this case in terms of the determinant of, a, of the Hankel determinant completed with a, with, with a row and a, and a column. Uh, and then you see immediately, very classical result, that the, the, the problem may come when, whenever um, dn, when the Hankel determinant that you construct with the moments of the weight function becomes zero. Um, okay, so that's nice, but um, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't simplify much. Um, because, okay, in this case, the way the moments are very simple, the way it functions is an exponential, so these are going to be gamma functions, essentially, incomplete gamma functions, but then you put a determinant of size, I don't know, 10, 20, 100, and then, well, who knows where, where the zeros are. Um, the nice thing is the connection uh, that has been explored in, in, in cases like that, and in, and also in other examples, uh, with uh, Pan-Levé equations. And this is where this, this uh, exponential deformation of a classical weight is, is relevant. It doesn't happen for any crazy weight that you, that, you, that you put there, but it happens when you have an exponential. In this case, this, this Hankel determinant, okay, the log derivative satisfies a sigma Pan-Levé equation. So you have the six Pan-Levé equations and you also have a, a list of six sigma Pan-Levé equations. Um, and okay, number five on this list that you can see in the works of Jimbo Miwa and Okamoto, um, uh, is, is this one, this, this differential, this nonlinear second order differential equation. And then it turns out that the sigma n, which is essentially the log derivative of the Hankel determinant plus all the things, satisfies this, um, this equation. Um, so here is the connection that the zeros of, of the uh, Hankel determinant are related, can be related to poles of a certain function that satisfies a Pan-Levé equation. So it's not clear how this helps computationally because finding the poles of, of solutions of Pan-Levé equations is a difficult problem. But the connection is nice. So here you have another, another perspective on the, on, the, on the same problem. Um, so how do, you, how do you prove this? So uh, Galina dis discussed it uh, yesterday. And also if, if there are many, many references if you, if you want to, to have a look one one good uh, recent reference is the book that, uh, that Walter wrote on orthogonal polynomials and Pan-Levé equations. There are, there are different ways to get to this, um, to this kind of identities related to Pan-Levé. Uh, one of them is, Riemann, is, is reuse the Riemann-Hilbert problem. I'm not claiming it's the best method or the easiest method, but I think it's, it's, uh, it has the advantage that it's quite systematic. So it's clear what you have to do, then the calculations can be complicated, but it's clear what you have to do and where you, you will arrive, okay? So the, the game is, is, uh, is take the, the, the matrix of the Riemann-Hilbert problem and then go to constant jumps. Instead of doing all the steepest descent uh, work, you just, in this case, very simple because the weight is exponential, you multiply by this diagonal matrix and then you can check that the, the, the jump for this matrix Z, Zn, becomes uh, constant in Z and in S and in N. And then uh, if you construct something like this, so you take the derivative of Zn times the inverse, then you can prove that the, that the, the derivative has the same jump as the Zn because the jump is constant. The inverse has the inverse jump, so they cancel each other. And then you multiply by this factor Z squared minus one because you have finite endpoints where you can introduce poles when you construct this, this product. Uh, but if you, if you compensate this pole Z squared minus one, then you have an entire function. And you have the asymptotics of this an from the Riemann-Hilbert problem. So, okay, entire function plus asymptotics 
then you will you will CRM tells you what AN is exactly. Well, I mean, exactly. And in terms of all kind of quantities related to the orthogonal polynomials. Um, and in this case, okay, in this case, it's clear because, well, you have C squared minus one and then you do partial fractions, then you're going to get a system like this. And this is a, it's a linear system with singularities at one minus one at in, an infinity. And this is pan level five. So from here, you can see which pan level you're going to get. Uh, other methods like, like ladder uh, operators and so on, they're simpler in some cases, but at least for me, sometimes it's a, it's a bit difficult to see why you get the pan level equation that you get of all the six or all the possible, uh, all the possibilities. But in this case, the structure is very clear where you have the singularities of this system and then you know which one it is. And then, okay, and then what you can do is because the jump is constant, you do the same thing with respect to N. So shift in N times the inverse is also entire. And you can deform with respect to S, derivative with respect to S times the inverse. So uh, using again, entire function and asymptotics, you can say, you can, you can describe what B, N, or C, N are. And then you have a whole set of identities. You have the recurrence relation, you have the formation equations, and then you can start combining them. So you establish compatibility between these identities. So you, you say, if I shift in N and I, I differentiate is the same as if, as if I differentiate and then I shift. So that gives me a relation nonlinear between the nonlinear relation between AN and BN and AN and CN and BN and CN. So if you combine all these results, um, and again, this is depending on the deformation that you have. So, so, so it doesn't work as far as I know, it doesn't work in general, but with an exponential, this type of exponential deformation, everything is, is, is uh, classical in the sense that you get discrete Panleve equations, you get the total lattice, and you get, uh, and you get continuous Panleve. So depending which, which identities you combine. Um, so um, the message here, maybe is that the value is that you start with some orthogonal polynomials and then you have a weight function that is complex. So there uh, is not clear if, if things are going to work, but you can characterize these problematic values in terms of poles of certain solutions of Panleve equations. In this case, um, the key is the Hankel determinant, um, and then the zeros of the Hankel determinant related to poles of some solutions of Panleve pipe. Actually, this is not too bad because it is not just a generic solution of Panleve five, which is a highly transcendental function that can be very complicated. You actually have a function that belongs to a special function solution. So this means that, okay, it's solution of, of Panleve five, but it can be written in terms of classical special functions. In this case, confluent hypergeometric functions. So, okay, this might not be too bad. And here's an alternative is just turn everything around. And instead of starting with orthogonal polynomials, as we did, uh, start with Panleve five in this case, and then um, study this, this family of, of special function solutions and use orthogonal polynomials to analyze them. And then this has been done in, in, the, in other Panleve equations. For example, people, are, people have worked on rational solutions of Panleve equations and using um, orthogonal polynomials. So you need to cook up some strange orthogonal polynomials in the complex plane and then do asymptotics. And also, it's interesting because you may find that the, the asymptotics that you need are different. So the large n asymptotics, which is the natural one for orthogonal polynomials, might not be the, the most natural one for Panleve equation. For Panleve equation, probably the, the, the natural asymptotics to look to look into is, is s tend to infinity. So that's a different different regime that you might con you might consider, and uh, it's it's a, it's a different different perspective. So just to finish, to give all the references, just to refer to all people I've, I've worked and many others on, on these complex orthogonal uh, polynomials, there is this uh, paper of Stel Baser, Jiang Chen, and Thorsten Erhardt on Pandeve 5 and time-dependent Jacobi polynomial. So this connection was known. They consider a deformation of Jacobi weight with a real parameter. The methodology for the geometric analysis and the, and the continuation in parameter space and the breaking curves and all that is based on work of Marco Bertola and Alexander Tovis that considered other uh, examples, the quartic exponential weight, for example. 
and of course all the methodology of uh, that I didn't say much about it, about the, the, the asymptotics of orthogonal polynomials and the potential theory and S-curves that are not mentioned before is based on the work of Goncha Rachmanov, Stahl, and, and others. And of course, the connection with Panleve is, is known in, in, in many different papers. There's, there's a good collection of, of, of examples and analysis in, in the book of in the book of Walter too. Um, so I, I think I'm more or less uh, done. Um, so just uh, uh, let me uh, finish here. It's not it's not the end. Um, Hopefully there's more to say about, about all this, but uh, for now, I think, I think it's, it's enough. So thank you very much for your attention. Questions, please. Sasha. I would like uh, to ask about uh, recurrence coefficients. Uh, uh, do yeah. you have a slide? Is it? So recurrence coefficients. Oh, you because I remember just a bigger and b bigger, and, and really ah. Where uh, do you mean the asymptotics or the? Um... Uh, no, you, you had the exact formula from Riemann Hilbert problem. Ah, for the p five, you mean or? Yes, yes. Uh, this one, no. No. Where did I have it? And b bigger. Uh, and from them, you said you derive uh, recurrence coefficients. Ah, here. Uh, wait, wait. This kind of identities. Yes, yes. And how you get from A and B a recurrence relation? Ah, yeah. Okay, because these matrices here, the, the, the capital A and capital B yeah. are, are here. So, so this the, these matrices will be written in terms of. This is that appear at infinity in the Riemann Hilbert. Yes. So, so over there you get the, the subleading coefficient and then the, the recurrence coefficients and all that. They are all, all hidden in this in this um, okay. in the asymptotics at infinity. Yeah. So it can be complicated because you have to do a lot of cleaning there, but that's that's where it comes from. Yeah. Yes, we have another question from Arno Kohlers. Arno? Uh, yeah. Uh, Alfredo, you had yeah. a result about Q squared plus Q prime, which has no yes. real zeros, right? Yes. That that was known or is it uh, what you had to prove? Um, uh, no, actually that was, that's the one of solution that you consider in your paper with Alexander and, and Ostenson. I think you call it a special. Uh, but did we, really, did we also prove that it has no real zeros? I think so, yeah, yeah. I think it's, it's it, I think it's, ah. I think, I think it's in your paper, yeah, that you prove that with, that there's a certain choice of. Okay, good to remind. Thank you for reminding me. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I think it's, I think it's done there. Then you have to match the notation and everything. But, but, but yeah, we found that this is exactly the solution for which you prove that is this pole free. So that was that was really helpful, actually. Yeah, very nice. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Other questions. No questions. Let's thanks, uh, speaker. Thank you very much.